This is Caveman Bob. Sporting a new clean shaven look, Bob needs to charge his battery. He looks a bit distracted while jamming to his favourite band the Club Thumpers. Careful Bob, you've got your wires crossed. Oh Bob, looks like you blew up your power supply. You should have been more careful. No matter what skill set or industry you're in, I'm sure I speak for most people when I say we've all been a Bob at one point in time and got our wires crossed and blown something up. Which is why in this video I'm going to show you all about reverse polarity protection, how to use them in your circuits and in your projects. Have you ever found yourself situated in a paddock full of cows and need to order circuit boards? Yeah, me neither. But if I did, I would use this video's sponsor, JLC PCB. Five circuit boards cost as little as $2. They offer fast production time and with a multitude of design options, you're only limited by your imagination. Ordering is as simple as going to jlcpcb.com, uploading your Gerber files and choosing your design preferences. You can also choose any colour solder mask at no additional cost. And if you're new to designing circuit boards, then check out my KiCad circuit board series to get you started. Look, look Daisy, free circuit boards. Let's start off with the most basic form of reverse polarity protection. A simple diode like the Silicon 1N4001 connected between the power supply and battery slash load provides good protection against reverse polarity. This particular diode has a forward voltage of 1.1 volts according to the data sheet. However, if I use my multimeter to measure the forward voltage, it's around half a volt. So why does this differ from the data sheet? Well, the voltage drop depends on several factors, the most important being how much current is passing through the diode. To act as a dummy load for testing, I'll use this 8 ohm power resistor. The power supply is connected to the diode and dummy load, while the multimeter is connected across the diode to measure the voltage drop. As I raise the voltage higher, notice how the voltage drop across the diode raises with the amount of current passing through the diode. This leads to more power loss and an excessive amount of heat that can damage the diode. You can calculate the amount of power loss that is converted into heat by multiplying the voltage drop across your diode by the amount of current passing through the diode, which is 2.33 watts of power being wasted as heat, which certainly isn't ideal. A better option is to use a Schottky diode, such as this SB540. What sets Schottky diodes apart from other diodes is they typically have lower forward voltages, which translate into lower power losses and lower temperatures, which is a big improvement over the silicone diode tested earlier. Whether you choose a silicone or Schottky diode, reverse polarity protection is excellent. I'll use this LED as a power indicator and attach my meter to the output of the diode. When the power supply polarity is correctly connected, the LED illuminates and the meter reads 11.3 volts. Although my power supply is set to 12 volts, remember there is a voltage drop across the diode. Now when I flip the connection so the polarity is reversed, the diode blocks the current and the meter shows zero. The advantages of using a Schottky diode are excellent reverse polarity protection, low cost and easy to implement. However, it comes at a cost. Output voltage is lower after the diode, aka forward voltage drop, and in high current applications, heat and power loss can be a big issue. An alternative method is to use a fuse and Schottky diode in this configuration. When everything is connected normally, power flows from the power supply through the fuse to the battery or load, as normal. However, if the battery slash load is reversed, the diode conducts power and is almost a dead short. This pops the fuse due to the amount of current being conducted through the diode and in theory saves the power supply from an instant death. I'll use an LED as a power indicator where the power supply would normally be connected. In this setup you can see the indicator LED illuminates as normal when the battery is properly connected. So let's flip the LED for the next test and this time try reversing the battery polarity and see if the LED turns on. If it does that means the Schottky diode and fuse didn't provide adequate protection. Well, I didn't see the LED turn on, and the fuse popped, so success, right? Well, before we jump to conclusions, let's replace the fuse, and break out my oscilloscope. The scope will be connected to the same points the LED indicator was connected to. Let's repeat the test. 
Well the fuse popped just like before, but when we look at the snapshot the scope captured, we can see not all the power was being conducted through the diode. 1.2 volts of power made its way past the diode slash fuse. So this didn't do a good job of providing reverse polarity protection. And if enough current passes through the diode, it can permanently short out the diode, meaning both the fuse and diode need to be replaced. On the upside, this protection is suitable for high current applications as there is no power loss and no wasted power being converted to heat. So the advantages of this method are no power loss, no voltage drop, low cost and easy to implement. However, it comes at a cost. High current can damage the diode and it provides low protection against reverse polarity and sensitive electronics will be damaged. Next let's look at using a P-channel MOSFET. I'm using an IRF 5210. I chose this because it can handle up to 100 volts, has very low on resistance of 0.06 milliohms, and can handle up to 40 amps of current. We also need a 10 volt Zener diode and a 100,000 ohm resistor. The components need to be connected as shown. I'll include schematics for download in the video's description if you're interested. Now I have the circuit assembled, let's put it to the test. As well as the indicator LED, I also have my multimeter measuring the voltage where the load or battery would normally be connected. I'll connect my power supply to the circuit. Power is flowing through the MOSFET and illuminating the LED, and the meter is reading 12 volts. Now if I flip the power supply connections so that they are reverse polarity, the MOSFET blocks the current and as you can see on the multimeter, the MOSFET is doing an excellent job at blocking the reverse polarity. Let's replace the LED with the dummy load, and use the multimeter to measure the voltage drop across the MOSFET. With only 120 millivolt drop across the MOSFET, power losses are minimal and the MOSFET is barely warm, with a modest 6 degrees Celsius temperature rise above ambient. Sounds like this is the ideal solution for every situation, right? Well, when it comes to loads, then yes, this is a great method. However, this method is unsuitable for power sources. Let me demonstrate. I'll swap out my dummy load for a power source, in this case a 12 volt battery, and move the LED indicator to the power supply side of the circuit. With the power supply connected, the LED illuminates just as you'd expect. I'll then connect the battery to the circuit. Now I'll disconnect my power supply. Notice anything strange? Even though the power supply is disconnected, the LED illuminates whenever the battery is connected. That's because unlike a diode, a MOSFET is bidirectional, meaning current can flow in both directions between the drain and source pins of the MOSFET. So this type of reverse polarity protection should only be used for loads, as power sources like this battery defeat the reverse polarity protection the MOSFET usually offers in this application. Also consider adding a heatsink in high current applications to keep the MOSFET below its maximum operating temperature. The advantages of using a MOSFET is there is almost no voltage drop. Excellent reverse polarity protection, but it does have a higher cost and is suitable only for loads. Here is a summary of all the methods used. Pause the video if needed. After pretending to blow up my power supply for the intro, it did have me wondering what, if any, protection did the manufacturer use. After removing the case, I found a Schottky diode across the positive and ground terminals. Without the addition of a fuse, this protection is all but useless and would likely result in a blown battery and power supply if I pulled a bob and connected a battery incorrectly. So I will be adding a fuse to my power supply in the near future. So to summarise, we've looked at several different methods of adding reverse polarity protection to your circuits and the takeaway from it is there is no one size fits all solution. Each solution has its own pros and cons which you'll use in different applications. So thank you very much for watching, if you found the video useful please give it a like and also consider subscribing. Thank you very much to my supporters on Patreon, you guys rock, and I'll be seeing you in the next video. Bye for now.